Welcome to the Rideshare Guy podcast, where you will learn about the rideshare and mobility industry straight from Harry Campbell, who's got over five years experience covering the industry and has talked to thousands of drivers. There's no better place to stay up to date, entertained, and educated. So let's dive in. Sam Aarons joined Lyft in 2018 as the Director of Sustainability, where he oversees Lyft's sustainability and climate impact efforts. Prior to Lyft, Sam spent 10 years at Google as Senior Lead for Energy and Infrastructure, where he co-led Google's achievement of 100% renewable energy. So big history there. And uh, before Google, Sam earned a BA in physics from Williams College and an MS in energy and resources from UC Berkeley, where his research focused on wind energy and plug-in vehicles, respectively. All right, Sam, how are you doing today? I'm great. How are you, Harry? I'm doing well. And uh, I guess as a driver of an electric vehicle, I'm excited to chat with you. And, uh, you know, I think that even though EVs aren't a huge part of uh, ride hail ride share today, I think that Lyft is obviously uh, hoping that they will be or committing that they will be. Does that sound about right? That's exactly right. Yes. For those who may not have heard, we, of course, made our big announcement back in June. Uh, of a new commitment to reach 100% electric vehicles on our platform by 2030. So the future is electric. Nice. Yeah. And we're definitely going to get into that announcement and I'd love to unpack that a bit. But first, I'd love to know a little, you know, I read off your bio, but I'd love to know a little more specifically about your role and maybe maybe tell us what does uh, Sam Aarons do on a day-to-day basis over there at Lyft? Well, back in the, uh, in the before times, we used <laughs> to all <laughs> be in our offices. Um, you know, we, we're, we're a small team, a sustainability mm-hmm. team. We have uh, kind of three to four to five people, depending on exactly how you count. Uh, but we actually report up through the policy side of the organization. So um, we can, we're going to talk probably at some point more about policy, but it's, a, it's an important component of the, of the electric vehicle world. Um, but, you know, it, it's a lot of um, both working on our EV uh, efforts across the organization with, of course, our friends on the operations side of the house, um, with the Express Drive uh, rental program, with our, our legal and comms teams and mm-hmm. the policy team. And, uh, you know, so there's a lot of cross, cross organizational uh, coordination to do for such a big and uh, ambitious effort. Yeah. And I guess that was sort of the first word that popped into my head when you were describing what you do cross, cross organizational, cross functional. I like the way that you put it. Maybe you could sort of set the scene for us right now. I mean, you gave us a little background on your team, but what is, what did the actual like EV efforts look like at Lyft today? I mean, are, you know, are that, do you guys have numbers on how many EV, EV vehicles are in your fleets or what programs you have running or, you know, what sort of like, what could I actually see out in the wild right now? And we can kind of start the conversation there. So today, the number of EVs that are out uh, in the wild, so to speak, is still relatively small. And that is a reflection of uh, just sort of the broader penetration of electric vehicles so far into the, you know, the overall vehicle fleet in North America. Uh, it's still a pretty small number. And what we're hoping to do is to really help to catalyze a transition, really not only for ride sharing, mm-hmm. but for the broader transportation sort of ecosystem as well. And, you know, essentially, um, you know, someone's got to go first and we're sort of putting a stake in the ground here to say we're going to, you know, raise the bar on ourselves and do everything we can to help accelerate electrification because ride sharing is such a good, we believe, such a good place to start. And if, if we can find some success, if we can create a path forward, we can help not only other companies, but also just many, you know, individual uh, consumers um, uh, adopt electric vehicles uh, today. And, you know, one example of that is in Colorado uh, last year where we actually worked with uh, the governor of Colorado, Governor Polis, and uh, some leaders in the state legislature to uh, help to change the law that governs the electric vehicle tax credit in the state. Um, And basically, uh, we wanted to make it easier for drivers uh, to to get access to electric vehicles, basically. Uh, And so this tax credit uh, now became available to ride share rental fleets, Mm -hmm. uh, meaning programs like Express Drive and and others. And because of that, that allowed us to basically uh, launch this access to electric vehicles through the Express Drive program in Denver. And, you know, boom, within four or five months, here we have, you know, now the largest, uh, one of the largest EV deployments in North America. Got it. And uh, so when you say one of the largest EV deployments, you're talking about the actual fleet of express drive vehicles in Colorado or? That's right. Yeah. So basically it's uh, 200 EVs that were, uh, we were able to get into Mm. the, um, 
express drive offering in Colorado. Uh, and that was sort of that chunk of 200 vehicles was one of the largest kind of single EV deployments uh, that has been done in North yeah. America. So with the fleet of uh, vehicles, so it sounds like uh, the policy, I guess, you know, I, I, I'm sort of seeing how you, you mentioned you, you work on the policy side, you kind of have, you know, either cities or local governments or states. Um, is there a subsidy happening or what happens to kind of enable you to launch that 200, uh, you know, vehicle fleet of EV cars? So taking a step back, you know, Today, uh, EV technology is not yet at what we call cost parity, meaning mm -hmm. it still costs more to buy an EV or, or to lease or rent right. an EV uh, than it would to, uh, to do that with a, a similar uh, gasoline vehicle. And so um, the good news is that battery technology has really, really improved dramatically in the past you know, 10 years. If you actually, there's a report out recently that found a 90% uh, decrease in battery costs wow. over the last 10 years. And of course, the battery is the most expensive part of an EV. So that has really helped to bring the cost of an EV down significantly. And it's on, a, it's on the trajectory it needs to be on to achieve this cost parity probably sometime in the middle of this decade. And nobody knows exactly when that will happen. But until that happens, um, it remains the case that unfortunately, uh, EVs are still more expensive than gasoline vehicles. And so that's why these incentive programs, like the one in Colorado, but also others, are so important because they actually help to bridge that gap to make it so that the buyer or the, the lessor or the renter of the EV mm -hmm. Uh, can actually do it at a cost that is much more comparable to an equivalent gasoline vehicle. Yeah, and I mean, I guess that's sort of why when we look out at the rideshare fleet that Lyft has on the streets right now, most cars are, I mean, not electric, I guess I would say, you know, either uh, ICE, internal combustion engine, or, you know, I mean, a lot of hybrids, right? Um, I, don't, I don't know if you have yep. numbers on how the fleet, I know we've looked at it in the past, but I think what we tell people is basically the best car for driving uh, right now is sort of like a two to three year old used Toyota Prius that hopefully you got a good deal on and maybe a, a low interest rate, right? Something like that is, uh, it sounds like you might agree that that's the best vehicle right now based on the economics. I think that's right. Um, that, you know, certainly hybrids are, are a great deal right now. Um, but what's interesting actually is that EVs uh, already, we're seeing drivers save a lot of money for those who are driving yeah. EVs actually. So, I mean, you know this, right? Being an, an EV driver yourself, um, but for those who, who don't drive EVs, um, just to go through some, some quick numbers, uh, so we're seeing, well, let me take a step actually, back, actually. Um, <clears throat> so EVs have two advantages that offset uh, some of their disadvantages, right? So uh, the maintenance cost of an EV tends to be lower because they have fewer moving parts, mm -hmm. right? There's no engine in there that with anything combusting, so it's just a battery. Um, and then also the fueling cost, meaning electricity charging, yeah. uh, in most places is cheaper than buying gasoline. And so those two savings components, uh, which would be expenses that you know most drivers would be paying for, um, can help to make up for the upfront uh, purchase cost of the EV. And what's that typical upfront uh, purchase cost difference right now, if you have kind of a ballpark or an example you can share? Yeah, so the example I like to use is sort of, um, you know, the, the Chevy Bolt, mm -hmm. which I believe is that the car that, that you drive? I have a Tesla. Oh, you have yeah. Tesla. Oh, nice. But I do like the Chevy yeah. Bolt, too. <laughs> I've driven it, and it's also right. a great car. It has a nice long range, 220 miles, I think. So, That's right. That's right. Yeah. Um, so if you look at a Chevy Bolt, you know, the MSRP is something like 37.5, mm -hmm. you know, roughly, before incentives and everything. If you look at, um, you know, a Chevy Malibu, you know, that might be, I don't know, 14, you know, 15K, something like, like that, roughly, let's just say. So you're talking about a pretty big delta. 14, right? 15K I mean, less, a, right? Um. Well, or is it? Yeah, I think it's about, I don't know the exact yeah, I, MSRP. On, on I, I guess we can talk ballpark. You know, obviously there's a lot that goes into car price, but you're not saying the Chevy Malibu costs $14,000, right? No, that's okay, right. The Delta so, is 14 but, or 15 K. The Delta is something like that, right? So it's still a pretty big um, Delta you have to And I guess with. that's now, if you ignore it. sort of the, you know, the, the, uh, subjective factors like how the car looks and you know the styling right and the, <laughs> every, everything else right if you just need a car for a ride share basically within reason comparably exactly exactly and this is just an example mm -hmm. right not everyone's going to want a malibu of course yeah. um so um but just to use a you know a, a comparative example 
Uh, so you, you have a pretty big delta, yeah. right? I mean, it's definitely more than $10,000 of delta. So the federal tax credit uh, is $7,500. And now that is not available for every car right. currently, right? Because it started to phase out for, for GM and for Tesla already. Um, but let's, let's just, for this example, let's say, you know, you've got the federal tax credit, 7,500, then you have uh, some state level uh, incentives. So in Colorado, right, there's this state level tax credit. That's, uh, it was 5,000 last year, it's 4,000 this year. California has a rebate, which is 2,500. Mm -hmm. So it sort of depends on where you are in terms of, you know, yeah. Uh, how many incentives you can sort of stack on top of each other and how much they're worth, but you're still talking, you know, a delta of at least a few thousand yeah. dollars between one and the other. Now, with the gas savings and the maintenance savings, you know, we we are seeing drivers who are currently saving somewhere between fifty and seventy dollars a week, mm -hmm. in, in some cases, on fuel savings alone. So if you kind of do the math there, you know, you will get a payback uh, on that upfront cost after a couple of years, but that's still tough, yeah. right? It's still tough to put out a couple extra thousand dollars and wait a couple of years to get paid back. So what we're trying to do, and this is really where our commitment, where, where the sort of the rubber meets the road, mm -hmm. is that it, it's up to us uh, to work with auto manufacturers to uh, aggregate the demand of all the drivers on the platform and help the auto manufacturers to see that, hey, there's there's actually a lot of demand here and therefore they need to increase the supply and we all know right from economics 101 that if you increase the supply the cost tends to come mm -hmm. down um, so we want to help to aggregate that demand help to bring the cost down of, of the upfront cost of the car and work with charging providers to allow access uh, to similarly aggregate that demand and you know buy electricity in, in bulk so to speak um, work with utilities to get more charging yeah. stations uh, installed so we we want to kind of uh, go after all the different pain points that currently exist for EV driving today, and, and it, don't get me yeah. wrong, it is not you know the best experience you could possibly have today. There's a lot of work yeah. to do. Um, so that's what we're trying to do to help make it a, a really, uh, a really compelling value proposition for drivers, so that people will basically be you know leaping out of their seats to say, why wouldn't I drive an EV? Yeah. It's going to save me money if there's enough charging, you know, et cetera, et cetera, then people will want to. And that's the state that we want to get to. Yeah. And so it sounds like sort of right now there's that at least a few thousand dollar cost difference, depending on the manufacturer that you're purchasing from and the state and federal rebates available. You know, that's sort of the minimum, which is going to be maybe a one to two year break even period at a minimum. Uh, who, what type of driver do you think, uh, you know, an EV kind of makes the most sense for? I mean, I, I guess I'm thinking, you know, like for those who don't know, you I mean, a full-time driver might put a thousand miles a week on their car. So is it just someone who's sort of the more miles, the better at this point? Or maybe there's specific states or, you know, like, like you said, right, I guess a state where you can maximize the state rebate, but also the federal rebate. And then you would have to buy a car that, uh, you know, where the, the rebate hasn't phased out yet, right? I guess that's maybe like the ideal person um, to buy an electric car or situation. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. We did a little bit of analysis over the summer. Mm -hmm. um, and we actually looked at uh, some individual, you know, driving patterns, just to sort of see like some real world examples. Yeah. And what we found is that um, there are some drivers, oh, right, we probably all know this, right? There's some drivers who drive a, a lot of miles that might be driving full time, uh, could be up to, you know, 30, 40, maybe some cases even 50,000 miles a year. Mm -hmm. Um, and other drivers who are doing this uh, part time and are maybe just doing, you know, a few thousand miles of rideshare driving a year might, might not be much at all. Um, we actually found that there are many drivers in each of those groups hmm. who could use an EV today just based upon the mileage that they're doing. Now, that doesn't take into account, you know, is there a charging station yeah. right near my home or right near my, you know, grocery store or whatever. So that, that's sort of another layer of analysis that we would have to do. but. Um, but what we found is that actually, for those who are not doing a lot of miles per year, there are some good options, like in fact, uh, used Nissan Leafs, hmm. right, which have a, you know something like 100 miles of range, but you can get it for just a few thousand dollars in some cases, if it's a three or four year old model. Um, and uh, on the other side of the spectrum, for those who are driving uh, you know, very high amounts of mileage per year, uh, in that case, a car like, let's say, a Chevy Bolt, which has, I think, as you said, something like 220, 230 miles of range, um, can actually cover 
something like 95 to 99 percent of the driving days that you might be doing. Mm -hmm. So sure, there's going to be one day out there where you get a really long trip, you know, to the next state over or something. Yeah. Um, but if you put those, you know, outlier examples to the side, yeah. uh, it's really the vast majority of miles of, of driving days that, that can be done by many drivers. Yeah. Well, I also imagine that, you know, going back to that cross-functional, there may be, I'm curious if you've looked into opportunities to work with, say, the product teams at Lyft to understand that, hey, you know, if we have a certain percentage of drivers that are on electric vehicles, we probably don't want to send them, you know, a bunch of long trips, or maybe there's a way to opt right. in or opt out or, you know, understand right. or even understand that, like, hey, this is the type of car they're driving. We know the range so that as the day, you know, gets to the end, right, like if they start if we assume they started with a full tank, we can't send them anything over 75 miles, you know, at the end of their shift. I'm, I'm curious if you've looked into any of those types of uh, product uh, opportunities. Right. Certainly those things are, are very important and, and will be very important. The more EV drivers that are on the platform, mm -hmm. um, those conversations are just starting now. So, you know, we're, we're still, we're still in the early days here. Um, you had asked earlier, you know, how many EVs are there on the platform? It, today, it's well less than 1% of, of cars mm -hmm. are electric. Um, so it's still small. Um, we're still in the really beginning On the phase Lyft platform, here. less than 1%. What's on that? the Lyft platform, less than 1%? On the Lyft yeah. platform. Okay. Yes, the Lyft platform. Um, so certainly those features will need to be built. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it wouldn't be a good yeah. EV driving experience if you... Get, get end up getting stuck with a yeah. really long ride at the very end of the day. Yeah. But I guess so, what you're saying at the same time, you have to balance the considerations for the 99% of the other drivers who, you know, may probably have tons of features and, you know, products and services that they want. Um, are there any other big, uh, I guess, opportunities that you see in the near future to sort of, I guess, you know, within the lift fleet accelerate, I guess that's a question. So what's like the biggest near term opportunity to get that number, you know, increasing and up from 1%? The nearest opportunity that we think we have is to actually focus on the express drive rental program. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and the reason it gets back to something we were talking about earlier, which is the highest mileage drivers will have faster paybacks, mm -hmm. right? On, on the slightly higher cost of the EV because the savings, uh, you save them, you, you save money basically every mile driven. Yeah. Right? You save on maintenance, you save on fuel. So that means those who drive the highest number of miles are going to save the fastest. And it's actually the express drive vehicles, the rental vehicles, that tend to be some of the highest mileage vehicles that there are, right? right? Because people are deliberately rent, you know, yeah. going out and renting a vehicle so that they can do ride sharing. They're going to drive a I lot. I think they right? get unlimited mileage too, so <laughs> it's nice. Yeah, right. Um, so the first area of focus is going to be continuing to work on the express drive program because we can help drivers to achieve those mm -hmm. savings more quickly and make the economics work more quickly. Yeah. And that we think that'll create kind of a positive feedback loop where, you know, that will create some new demand for electric vehicles, which then will help auto manufacturers to, you know, mm -hmm. send it, send a signal to them. Basically that they need to create more supply, bring the cost down. And then as the cost comes down, that will help drivers who drive slightly fewer miles per year electrify economically and once they've done it, yeah. that'll help bring the cost down even more. So it'll sort of, we think it'll sort of leapfrog from the highest mileage drivers okay. to the next highest mileage to the next highest mileage, et cetera. Yeah. So definitely starting with the highest mileage drivers makes sense. I guess the sort of, you know, leapfrogging between, you know, okay, we've got now a few hundred drivers and then going to the EVs, that seems like it would take a, quite a while, right? Especially knowing the automotive, you know, product cycles, right? Like usually they're, you know, four to five years <laughs> in the making for their next vehicles or their supply. Um, so I imagine that, uh, I, I don't know, I guess I'm curious, are you relying on that much? Or, you know, I guess the other big piece to me seems like the government incentives, right? Because, I mean, I guess there's still the break-even period, but, you know, a one to two break even pe year break-even period is very reasonable, um, but that's also with pretty big, you know, majority government incentives, right? So how do those government incentives play in? And I'm assuming you're a big fan of those. Um, so I'm curious to hear your thoughts there. Yes. So in terms of the incentives, um, so of course we, we know that there's the federal incentive and as we talked about it, it has already phased out for GM cars and for Tesla cars. Right. Um, so who does that leave are... just by the way, like what are the big, you know, EV makers after that? Nissan, Leaf? Yeah. Well, actually in, that's exactly what I was going to say next. So, um, what what we're seeing in terms of the you know number of models out there is that as of right now, as of today, mm -hmm. September first, 
uh, there are not tons of different EV models out there. Yeah. However, starting in the 2021 model year, which is starting right mm -hmm. now, basically, and going into the 2022 and 2023, right, there are a number of manufacturers, particularly uh, European manufacturers like Volkswagen and others, who have already announced that they're planning to introduce a number of new EV models. So I think what we're going to see in the next couple of years actually is sort of a maybe explosion is the right yeah. word, but you know, a, a lot of new models um, be introduced. And I think that's going to create a lot of choice, a lot of variety. Um, and, uh, and that will help to both kind of allow people to, to regain access to the federal tax credit, which will not have yet expired for those manufacturers. Um, and it will just create competition in the marketplace, right? So there's going to be a, uh, I think a positive cycle there yeah. where we're going to have a lot more choice and a lot more options available. Yeah. And I mean, I guess you, you mentioned the Nissan Leaf earlier, but I think the one thing too that I know a rideshare driver would consider is, you know, probably anything, I, I feel like any it, a car, or an EV car has to be kind of at least in that two to 300 mile range. I remember a few years ago, we did a guest post from someone who was driving a Nissan Leaf and this was an early version. And so it might've even been less than a hundred miles and the battery had deteriorated <laughs> over time. And so it was basically taking, you know, two or three lunch breaks a day, you know, to charge up. Um, Cause I guess, the, I'm curious what you, th so I guess what, what's your thought on the range? I mean, that these drivers need, is there an ideal range or what are you seeing there? I mean, other than, you know, range is getting better obviously, but what are your thoughts? Well, what we found when we looked into this a little bit in more detail this summer was that, um, there is a group of, a, you know, a number mm -hmm. of a, a pretty good chunk of drivers mm -hmm. who are not even doing a hundred miles per mm -hmm. day or even 80 miles per day of rideshare driving. So, for those drivers, presumably, you know, at least theoretically, yeah. they could actually use a Nissan Leaf with a pretty short battery range um, for, you know, almost all or even all of the driving that they do. Um, and at the same time, there's a group, you know, there are many drivers who drive, you know, many, many more miles per day mm -hmm. and, and are driving, you know, 30, 40, 50,000 miles a year. And for those drivers, they, they really do need a higher mileage uh, vehicle that has more like 250 plus miles of range, like a Bolt or like a Model 3 or like many of these new models that are going to be introduced in the upcoming model years. Yeah. Are there any other benefits that uh, you think drivers often consider? I mean, obviously the financial you know impact is, I think, first and foremost in a lot of people's minds. But I think one thing I like to look at, too, is you know if I can make it a good financial deal to get an EV or get solar or whatever, I'm also kind of saving the environment, right? <laughs> I think, you know, it's tough. I feel like that's icing on the cake, but are there, is there anything else like that, that uh, other considerations or factors? Well, you know, we know that it's something that a lot of our passengers care mm -hmm. about. Um, you know, part of Lyft's um, kind of culture is that we, right. we want to, you know, do things that are good for um, the communities in which we operate and do things that are good for the environment. Um, and I think a lot of our passengers care about that. And, and I know this is a driver-focused um uh, segment. But the reason I say that is because um, what's good for passengers is good for drivers. Right? So if a passenger cares about the environment and wants to take a ride that's green and to minimize their impact, they're going to be excited to take a ride with a driver in a green car yeah. that could, I'm not going to always say that it will, but it could lead to higher tipping. Yeah. It could lead to more, you know, higher ratings for the driver. Mm -hmm. um, and, and frankly, it's just a cool, you know, experience to kind of geek out about yeah. uh, EVs and talk about all the cool things, you know, about this, this neat new technology. Um, so ultimately, you know, it, we, we believe that EVs are going to get to the point where they are more economical for drivers on their own. Plus you have all these added on benefits, like it's good for the environment mm -hmm. and riders care about it. And therefore they're going to have a better experience, which is also good for trucks. Yeah. And I mean, I think definitely, uh, you know, like I said, I think most people kind of look at the finances first and foremost, and that's probably the primary driver of their decision. But there are some nice kind of what I look at as like fringe benefits. Um, and, uh, you know, I think if the fleet is less than 1% electric at this point, it's tough to, you know, integrate it into the product or even, you know, come out with a, you know, eco, you know, eco-friendly mode, I guess you would say, where it actually paid drivers more. But I imagine I would love to see, you know, in the future, if it was full or 5% and, you know, in especially cities, higher penetration, you know, drivers could actually make more money off of doing, you know, a rides with an electric or even a hybrid vehicle too. That seems like a win-win for everyone. It's a great point. And, you know, we are actually already testing something out called green mode, mm. which yeah, is I saw that. currently active. In, yeah, exactly. It's in, currently in Seattle and Portland, Oregon. Okay. Two um, very green cities. 
two gray green cities with with lots of uh, hybrids and and some EVs. Uh, still not you know significant quantities of EVs yet, um, but we are seeing um, you know increasing utilization of that feature. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's something that riders are discovering and using. And of course, the drivers who are able to drive in that mode are, are, are benefiting as well for that reason. So, and that uh, um, charges are, them more or is it just a, its own mode? It doesn't charge mm. more. It's, it's just its own mode currently. Um, you know, who knows what kinds of things we might want to test out or, mm. or you know, experiment with in the future. But um, currently, we, we're kind of considering this a, a V1 and we're seeing how it works. And trying to figure out when and where we might be able to expand it or change it or try different things. Yeah. So one of the big complaints that I hear from drivers who are out there driving with electric vehicles right now is sort of the lack of charging stations. Um, and I guess specifically, I know for a while you guys were partnered with uh, GM um, on the Lyft Express Drive. Now, you know, I guess GM was doing their own thing and renting out Chevy Bolts to drivers and are no longer doing that. And, you know, they offered free charging to drivers. It sounded great. But then when you went to go find a charging station, there were no charging stations available. So I'm assuming that's something you're carefully looking at. So how do charging stations fit into this? And I think uh, probably everyone agrees we need more, right? Absolutely. We need more, 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 more. Definitely. Lots of more charging stations. Um, you know, our strategy so far has been actually to work with third parties. Uh, mm -hmm. As you mentioned previously in the past GM, uh, currently we're working with EVgo and Electrify America, which are two charging companies. Yeah. Um, they basically, uh, you know, we're working with them to kind of uh, make charging easier and more affordable uh, in the cities where we have uh, our express drive EVs mm -hmm. that are offered um, as a starting point, right? So eventually, you know, of course, this needs to be available to all drivers, whether you're doing express drive or whether you're driving your own car, um, it needs to be available everywhere. And it's going to be sort of a step-by-step -step process. So we've started in a few cities for now. Yeah. Um, and for, for those drivers who are renting an EV uh, with uh, the Express Drive program, uh, they actually they get free charging mm -hmm. uh, on these networks. And uh, because we have this agreement, um, that helps uh, these two charging providers get a sense of when and where drivers are needing to charge and can help inform where they're going to build their next charging station. So mm -hmm. we think this, too, is going to be a positive feedback cycle. That's sort of the more... Uh, we do, the more data we will collect and the more we'll know about what are the right places yeah. uh, to put charging stations, then we got to get those in the ground yeah. right, to make it actually work. And have you looked at sort of the location of where drivers live and kind of their home access to charging stations? Because I know that, you know, I'm here in Los Angeles and lucky to have a home where I can charge my car. But, uh, you know, depending on where you, obviously apartments are much more difficult, although, you know, things are happening there, right? It's becoming easier to put a charging station in a garage. Um, but, uh, I, cause I feel like that's a big component too, right? Obviously you need to charge up at the end of every night. That's right. I'm really glad you brought this up because <clears throat> I think we tend to think about just about these so-called fast charging stations, mm -hmm. which are kind of, you know, would be sprinkled throughout the city and you sort of, you would have to stop right during the right. middle of the day to charge at one of these things. It may be relatively quick. It might be 10, 15, you know, 30 minutes, uh, let's say, but it's still a stop that you might have to take, right? So overnight charging or home charging is very important because it's more convenient, right? Because you can just plug in yeah. just like your cell phone. You get home, you plug it in, you wake up, it's charged, right? That's That would be the yeah. ideal. And importantly, it tends to be cheaper. Definitely. And the reason is for that is because the charging rate is slower. Mm -hmm. So basically the faster you're charging, the sort of the, the more strain you're putting on the electricity mm -hmm. grid. So these fast chargers, you have to pay for that strain that you cause by charging super quickly. Mm -hmm. Whereas an overnight charger, uh, you don't have to pay as much because you're not putting as much strain because it charges more slowly. Yeah. So it's it's actually a really important component of our strategy to focus not only on getting more access to fast chargers sort of throughout a city and its you know its surrounding mm -hmm. areas, but also importantly to help drivers get access to overnight charging, whether that's in you know, if, if you have, if you live in a home and you have a garage, whether to put that in a, in a garage or if you live in an apartment building, you know, trying to work with landlords and local, you know, utilities to get those installed in your apartment buildings, you know, garage, yeah. for example. So we're just starting some work on some pilot projects um, on that type of overnight uh, charging and 
hope to have some exciting things to report at some point here once we see how it goes. Very cool. Well, you know, the last question that I wanted to ask you that I think uh, will round out this conversation well, and you mentioned that, you know, Lyft's origins, uh, obviously, I think uh, they, they're very well known as, you know, an environmental friendly company and then the whole history with, you know, I guess, actually carpooling and ride sharing, actual ride sharing. And how, how do you see other modes fitting into this electrifying uh, push, right? Because obviously Lyft also has scooters and bikes and integrations with public transit now. And, you know, I've seen some pushback on not Lyft necessarily, but more generally the federal and state incentives that, you know, hey, that's $10,000 going to a car. But now there's e-bikes. Now there's e-scooters. You know, that, that could be a lot more efficient to subsidize, you know, a $1,500 e-bike than a $50,000 car, or $40,000 car. So I'm curious how you think about those and specifically like the modes uh, that you're, you have available to yourself at Lyft. Well, you know, there, there are different modes. Um, we, we have become a, a multimodal transportation platform, mm -hmm. um, which, you know, as you mentioned, we, we started out just offering ride sharing and now we have these different modes as well. Um, you know, those are important environmentally, certainly. Um, there are, you know, lower emissions uh, for taking a bike or scooter, for example. So, you know, I think that, um, you know, pe people have different needs. Mm -hmm. uh, so sometimes the trip you're taking might be really short. Uh, so, you know, hop on a bike, hop on a scooter. Other cases, you're going to the airport and you have 12 suitcases, yeah. so you've got, got to take a car for that, right? So um, it really depends on the needs people have, but we want to be able to be a, a platform that offers um, multiple options for for uh, our, our users, basically. Cool. Well, I appreciate you coming on, Sam. And if uh, folks want to learn a little bit more about Lyft's sustainability efforts and your team's work, is there is there a good place you guys are publishing your research or some of the stuff that you mentioned, some of the calculations, the numbers you guys are crunching? Definitely, yes. Um, if you go to actually liftimpact.com, you can find uh, a link to um, a lot of this information. Very cool. All right. Well, appreciate you coming on, Sam, and uh, best of luck. I look forward to seeing more EVs in the fleet of Lyft in the future. Thanks, Harry. Great to chat with you. All right. Take care.